Welcome back to the channel and welcome back to another edition of the Spurs Chat Podcast. I'm just a stone's throw away from the city ground, just come out the stadium. Of course, Spurs have picked up another three points, a really good win for Tottenham Hotspur after a very uh, difficult first half. Spurs finally got the win, Richarlison and Kulisewski getting the goals. Um, of course, we are here to talk about that win. I've got three very special guests as normal to talk about this game. We've got Richard Whitehead, MBE, back with us. Rich, how are you? How's it going, mate? You all right? How cold are you tonight? It's very cold here in Nottingham. <laughs> At some point during this stream, I will be walking back to the car, but I am starting the podcast here right outside the stadium. We've also got channel regular Craig Dearman back with us. Craig, how are you? Yeah, I'm all good. Yeah, a bit, bit of a nervy game there at points, but we got over the line. Um, a lot to discuss tonight's game, I think. Yeah, you're all sitting there in your nice warm houses. Lee, the Dorset Spur is back with us as well. Lee, how are you? I'm just about calming down now. I'm just about getting back to levels. My blood pressure is just about getting to where it needs to. So I'm all good, thanks. Well, Lee, let's start the show with you then, um, because another win for Tottenham. It's been a good week for us. Um, we are now only four points away from first place Liverpool in the Premier League. And you know to get to this halfway point in the league season, only four points away from top spot, it's pretty impressive, but it was hard watching that first 45 minutes, wasn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. I um, I, I was kind of watching it um, whilst looking at my phone and trying to keep my mind off the game at the same time. It was a, a bit of a stressful game to watch, to be fair. It, you know, we start so well and then you can see them gradually getting in the game and you think to yourself, could this be the one that kind of takes us back again? And uh yeah, I was a little bit worried, I've got to be honest. But, you know, we got there in the end, so that's the main thing. Lee, overall, with the performance, um, getting the three points, you know, grinding results out sometimes, it's so important. And I tell you what, Nottingham Forest, the city ground, that was that place, you wouldn't think that their manager is on the verge of getting sacked because all the fans this evening inside the city ground were behind the manager. Uh, the atmosphere was electric from the home fans um, this evening. And I've got to say that every away game that I've been to this season... They quietened down the Spurs' end that first 45 minutes, and it was electric, as I say. Um, but really, really important to get the three points tonight, wasn't it? Absolutely. I, you know, I, to be honest with you, watching it on the TV, you could hear the you could hear the Forest fans. And fair play to them; they were brilliant all the way through, even right towards the end. I thought they were really good. And and, and Tottenham's travelling fans are, generally speaking, all you can hear on the TV. Like you know, they they do follow really, really well. So. Fair play to them. And, and to be fair, I, I thought Forrest had a good game. You know, it's a bit, I won't say harsh on them to lose the game, you know, the way they did in the end. But um, they worked really, really hard. And I thought they they made it more difficult for us. And they added to the difficulties that we had in that game. I, I thought they kept us at bay an awful lot. So, you know, fair play to them for, for, for the effort they put in. So, yeah. Rich, let's come to you. Let's, what did you make of the game? Oh my goodness! Um, lots of lots of um, issues uh, in that first half, and um, I think just to get into that into the half time, one goal up in injury time, and then to re recoup, re kind of look at how we're moving the ball. We're far too slow. I felt that um, the the, the players that were on the ball the most were, were our centre backs. Like Ben Davis, how many times did he have the ball? And he was. Um, I just felt we were far too slow. Uh, we lost some real impetus in the game. And like you said as well, Forrest have a knack of using that 12th man really well to inspire the, the players on the pitch to. Um, uh, empower the team to be to be better, and and you could see it through the through the half. And we were lucky to get the the goal that when we did, because that that took the wind right out the the sails. And uh, for me, there was some real key moments in that game that today Spurs had the uh, run of the green. Craig, let's come to you. What did you make of it? Yeah, much the same as the boys have said. It was um, it was a funny game. You always you always going to get a, a tough game against Forest. We we never seem to get into our stride um, again against them, especially especially considering recent results like the FA Cup 
uh, game the other year. So, so yeah, we knew it was never going to be easy today. Um, like Rich said, it's a battle, battle inside. Um, crowd massively behind the managers of the team, as and you say. And look, we just we just put in a fairly professional performance tonight, albeit with a ridiculous suspension, which I'm sure we'll come on to, uh, which I hope doesn't damage us. But um, we look, we we would have gone there in in past seasons and lost that game. So you, we have to look at the positives tonight. That that was a that was a big win tonight. And regardless of who people think. Forest are they're they're a good side and a good battling side, especially at home. So, so we should be pleased. Three points take take back to uh, the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, which is great. But um, yeah, it just sticks in the back of your throat that that stupid sending off. But I'm sure we'll come on to it. Greg, I don't want to be too negative about the first 45 <laughs> minutes because there were a lot of fans around me and playing the way that you know Poster Coglu wants us to play, but. At the end of the day, we've got to be, I suppose, really positive with how things have gone this season. And like I said earlier, to get to this halfway point of a Premier League season under Ange, you know, in his first six months, to be only four points away from top spot, sometimes you've got to just grind results out like tonight. Yeah, you have. And that's spot on. Yeah, we, we're, we're level on points with City with three behind the Woolwich. And like you say, four off the top. So... And I know we're a game in front, essentially, but, you know, we've done our job and now it's up to everybody. We can kind of sit back for the rest of the weekend and relax and hope a few of the results go our way. But we've had some setbacks this season already. I mean, the discipline is an issue. You know, four red cards uh, in the season already, which which is possibly a record, I don't know. Uh, Certainly on par with Liverpool. Uh, this season, but it's probably a record for Tottenham in the Premier League to have four red cards by Christmas, I would imagine. Um, but we're still kind of getting those results. We had that dodgy. It does does make me think where we would be had we not had those disciplinary issues and had that Chelsea game not been the turning point. 16 points dropped from winning positions this season. You know, we could have been sitting at the top of the league, which is way, way, way ahead of the project expectations. So, We've, we've had a lot to deal with, or Andrew's had a lot to deal with, um, and we're starting to get back on track. And I just hope these suspensions and, and the injuries don't hurt us over the Christmas period because there's a lot of points to be won there. So, yeah, a lot to be positive about, but we've just got to keep an eye on our discipline, I think. Lee, let's come to you on the discipline. Um, I've got to admit, this season under Ange Postacoglu, I've really liked the way that we have been so aggressive in these games. But, you know, being a sensible fan, you've got to look at how many yellow cards and red cards that we're picking up. What have you made of the the aggression that this side has shown so far this season? I don't think you can I don't think you can play this game at this level without any level of aggression. I think you've got to have aggression. I, I think obviously it's a different sort of game these days compared to how it was kind of years ago. And some of the stuff you, you see now wouldn't have been an issue previously. Um, but I, the ones for me that have been the most disappointing, obviously the one today, I think, you know, as, as Craig's touched on, it's a, it's a, it's a silly one because he's, he's in no man's land. There is no real reason for him to make that tackle. And it, and it kind of looks worse because of, uh, you know, when they slow it down, that always does make it look worse. Um, Cause it looked to me like he, he you know, he's, he's, he's caught him quickly. He's, he's probably not gone right through him or whatever. Still an absolutely red card. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it's not. But I think, you know, that sort of thing is just, that's the annoyance. I don't mind if a player's really going for it, you know, 50-50, trying to get the ball, blah, blah, blah. I, I understand that. But but when you're in that position like he, like Bissoma was today, I think, you know, that's that's just a silly one. I mean, the other one for me, that the, the yellow card that U- Udogi got, for, for a shoulder barge, I, again, I was perplexed with that. I'm like, how, how is that a yellow card? Because, you know, I've, I, you see a few of them. Was it Yates, the, the, the other kiddie's name, who uh, was throwing himself all over the place and, and, and some quite strong tackles in there. And I, again, I've got nothing wrong with it, no, nothing against that. Um, but if one's a yellow card, then I can't see where, where the other one gets away with it. So... You know, it's, it's a strange one. I, I don't mind the aggression. I just think you've got to be a bit careful because otherwise someone like, certainly someone like um, 
Um, uh, defender. Davis. Romero. Romero. Bloody hell. Someone like Romero is going to get a name for himself and he's got to be really, really careful that he doesn't just get picked out. He's already you know. got that name. He's already yeah, got Yeah, I, I know, but you, you, you know what I mean? Like, he got away with one. He got away with one um, recently, didn't he? And and I think, you know, he's got to be so careful because a 50-50 um, is going to go more against him because of, of, of you know, he's built that, that reputation for himself. You know, it was like today, said, wasn't it? It, it, it? There was a close one today where they where they were kind of go, oh, damn, that's a difficult one. But and I thought, well, not really. He kind of toe poked the ball away, and the, the he barely touched the player. I think he got a yellow card for it. And I'm like, you know, come on. But if that had been a different play, he probably wouldn't have got booked even. So, thing is, Lee, I thought I I honestly thought the Bissouma one was a red card at the time mm. because I. As soon as he, 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 I think he took a heavy touch, and I, th- I saw it. You just know what's coming, and you think he's off. I, I, it, it, it's, yeah. it was just stupidity, and just knew it was going to happen. That was it. It was so avoidable as well, you know. Yeah. Just stand your ground. What I'd say, I'm sure we'll come on to it, but I thought Ben Davies was absolutely outstanding again tonight, and he just shows that you haven't got to go in like that to win the ball. You know, he hardly put a foot wrong. All right, he got a yellow, but you know. So you don't need to go in like that. And I think there's something wrong with Bissouma. The amount, the amount of times you see him do that. And like you say, like Romero, they got away with it. I love the aggression, but it's got to be controlled aggression, you know, because it's going to cost us. Yeah. And just coming back on that Ben Davies one, the guy didn't put a foot wrong and he got booked for putting his arm out. Yeah. That, yeah. You know, and that's my point about some of these bookings. You think, really? Is it, it, it Does that really deserve right. a booking? So, you know. Yeah. Rich, that is exactly where I was going to go. Uh, Lee and uh, Craig have, have mentioned Ben Davis there because he is a player that has been criticised by Spurs fans for a long, long time now. And whenever he seems to come in, he does the job. And I think that he's done a fantastic job coming in under Ange Postacoglu. But there were a couple of players tonight that I think is worth mentioning. Um, Kulusevski, uh, Vicario in goal, Ben Davis. I thought the three of them were excellent. Who was your man of the match? Yeah, for sure. I know Kula Chesky was uh, man of the match um, on on the extra TV. But for me, I think Ben Davis um, was a real rock at the back. Um, stayed on his feet as, as best he could um, and really um, dominated that line that we that we held. Because obviously we needed to for obviously the goal that was dis- disallowed. But I thought he actually... He didn't just come in and fill a space today. Um, he did really well and he's really grown into that role. Uh, and that's the real impressive thing. You, you, you listen to Anjan and, um, and what he's saying around Ben Davis's role in the team and how he's been really impress, impressed by how he's applied himself to that role. Um, and as we know, within within the game of football, it's about partnerships and he's, he's really developed that partnership with Romero, and uh, for me, that's really important. That's really important. And if if we, we don't have those partnerships in the pitch, we will really struggle in the own We will really struggle in the you hear me? You can hear me twice. <laughs> I think it's sounded twice. Two Chris's. <laughs> I, I think I think Ben Davies was outstanding, like I say, though, Rich. I, so I just said, I mean, he, was, he, he is an unsung hero these last few games, but he's come in and done such a good job, hasn't he? He's just, he's just been brilliant. For sure. And, and obviously, that, that side of uh, the, the defence is something that is... Such a good is, job, isn't it? It's, it's just been brilliant. Left, left sure, side of the defence. Obviously, that, that side um, of... Uh, Chris, you might want to mute your phones at the moment. Live, 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 live streams. This is, this is, this is, <laughs> this is what it's all about. That's it. He's in Nottingham. He's in trouble. Yeah. That's it. What the, what, what the what four, four G not very good up there, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> that's, it. that's it no I think um, just going back to what I said about uh, Ben Davis and obviously that left footed uh, defender 
Um, yeah, yeah. For me, I think uh, you obviously did really well. Um, we're we're going to really this ill discipline that obviously you guys talked about before is going to catch us up in in the future because not only obviously the suspensions through the red cards, but the accumulation of yellow cards that we will yeah. have throughout the team. And obviously today with Ndoggy, uh, and then obviously other players like Romero that are close to a suspension as well, that that would work really worry me in the coming weeks, um, especially as we've got quite a few games coming up over that Christmas period. And uh, we want to have some momentum now moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. Rich, let's stay with you because Anne said only a couple of weeks ago in one of his pressers that if we can get through December and be in a good position, you never know what's going to happen. And, you know, he said in yesterday's presser, he's not aiming for fifth. He's obviously aiming for the top four. Do you think we're going to get there? (laughs) Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I I visualise that this question might come up at some point. (laughs) (laughs) Listen, um... The manager obviously is going to say that there's there's a possibility of winning all these games, especially through the December period, um, and then obviously we're hoping for the investment in January and uh, getting some of those key players back from injury and now from suspension. Um, for me, obviously the sky's the limit with the team. We're we're playing very well in certain games. We obviously grinded out a result today, which is really important, like you said, Chris. And um, we need to back the manager. And that's that, That's what we all want. We want, obviously, the board to back the manager in January, the, the fans to be behind the, the philosophy of the, the manager moving forwards. And together, we're going to be stronger. And uh, I think that's that's why when you go to the home matches now, it's like a nightclub and everybody's in there enjoying themselves and enjoying the party and, and how we're playing. It's infectious, right? So why can't we dream to be higher up the league? Well, it's like a nightclub at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, but it's pretty quiet in Nottingham uh, this season, Rich, I've got to say. Hey, when um, was the last time you went to a nightclub, Chris? <laughs> when was the last time? Not long ago, actually. Was it? Was it? Is there a story there or what? That's, a, that's another story. <laughs> Craig, let's come to you. Um, God, you completely put me off my track now. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Come on, there must be a story. Tell us that story. <laughs> <laughs> um... Craig, to be in this position in the Premier League table, Andrew said about the process. Um, we've got the January transfer window coming up, of course. Uh, Richarlison scored again this evening. So many positives. And as you said, and as we've spoken a lot off air uh, between us, that you know some of those defeats, I think all of us fans can know and realise why we lost those games because of the injuries that we've had. How far do you think Andrew Postacoglu can take this team this season? I, th- I personally think top four is uh, achievable. And as you say, Rich Arlison's now scoring goals. He's be- unbelievably got more goals than Luis Diaz this season, Fernandez, a um, couple of other players that you would expect to see up the list. So he- he's he's ticking on, he's ticking on and getting the goals. Um, I think we can finish top four. I think it's achievable. I think I don't think we can rely on that fifth place going down to the Champions League after Newcastle and Manchester United went out. The, the coefficient, um, we we dropped out of that automatic second um, country that gets the the extra place at the moment. I think um, Spain went ahead of us. So, uh, but that all depends on how the teams do um, across all European competitions. So, let's hope all our English teams go very far and deep into the competition. And um, I hope Arsenal get to the final and get pumped ten nil, as, as Ali come on the channel and said that would be that would be brilliant. Um, but you know we can't rely on that fifth place. But I, I personally think fourth place is is more than achievable if we keep going. But if we keep if we keep key players fit and if we stop getting these silly suspensions, I think I think I think we got a chance. Yeah, I, re- I really do. Um, you know we've we scored this. We've got a new club record. Now scoring in the most consecutive Premiership games, um, I can't remember what that number is, but it, I mean that's a feat in itself. That wouldn't have happened last season. So a lot of positives, and I, I think get through this Christmas period. Hopefully, get a few players through the door early, and we got a chance. We've definitely got a shot. But 
top four has got to be that that goal. He's, he's uh, Ange said he didn't come here to finish fifth, wasn't it? Absolutely. He, he's he's going to be targeting. Well, he's going to be targeting winning it, but I think we're a fair ways off that. I think we'll all agree, but I think top four is achievable easily. Lee, let's come to you. Of course, Ange went with exactly the same team that beat Newcastle at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium at the weekend. Um, had to be, didn't it? Well, pretty much. I mean, his, his options are fairly limited, aren't they? To, to be honest with you, to kind of to, to really kind of change it up, uh, considering the amount of players that are out. So uh, it made sense to me to to keep with the same the same team. Obviously, um, La Celso picked up an injury, I believe. So so that kind of put him out as well. So you know, where else is he going to go? To be honest with you, unless he goes with you know, in, as he did in the end with. Um, with Hoiberg and, and Skip, that's his only other kind of options. But considering how well the team performed against Newcastle, you've got to go for the go for the same kind of kind of setup. I, I mean, me personally, I was expecting us to have a really good game here tonight. And and for me, as I said at the beginning, it's credit really to, to Forrest of, of how difficult they made it for us to be able to play the game we wanted to play. So, you know, I, I don't think there was any other option, to be honest with you. I don't want to go off topic from Tottenham, but just to talk about Steve Cooper a minute, um, Lee. Do you think it would be unfair that he would get the sack after the, this evening's game, bearing in mind what Nottingham Forest done in the game? I'm kind of reading between the lines there because you're kind of breaking up all over the place on that dodgy Nottingham uh, 4G they've got, got over there. A little bit. Did you hear that, Lee? Um, but yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I, I absolutely think it's unfair for Steve Cooper to, to get the sack. I think he's done a brilliant job there um, uh, over the last couple of seasons. And I think, you know, sometimes you need to go through those really difficult times to, to, to see the benefit of it, of the consistency and stuff. So, you know, for, for me, I, I think he's he's done a really good job there. So I'll be I'd, I'd be uh, I'd be shocked um, if he doesn't end up with a sack at some point. But I think it's a shame if he does because it's just the way of the modern game, isn't it? That they, you know, you, you can only go so far and then you're out the door. Given even though you've done sort of really good things in, in setting the club and taking it forward and so on, but you I, know, I, th I think Chris obviously with the game tonight, it was always going to be slightly different than the Newcastle game, obviously. Playing Newcastle, the ball playing team, and Forrest were set that low block and literally went just break us down. We're going to sit everybody behind the ball and we're going to try and counter attack you. Um, but the pleasing thing was that we actually could break them down and obviously score twice. Uh, where in the past we wouldn't have been able to do that or we wouldn't have had the uh, the patience to do that. And um, Forrest beat Aston Villa at home. And then to be able to um, go to Forest and, yes, uh, ride our luck a little bit, but then also kind of come away with the points is really pleasing. I think they were really physical. And uh, the referee, I think when he looks back at the actual game itself, um, he he was definitely favourable on the home home players like Ryan Yates. I, I think he had five or six kind of, uh, challenges that were slowing the play down. And I think after probably three or four of them, we definitely should have got a yellow card, especially obviously targeting Sonny in the first 10 minutes. And um, I think Forrest were playing very physical that first half. And um, they obviously identified that they didn't want uh, Kuliseski and Sonny running at them early doors to set the tone of the match. Can you guys hear me okay now, yeah? Yeah. That's definitely as the car park. <laughs> right. So, the match stats from this evening's game. Oh, oh I think uh, def definitely some dodgy 4G up there. Rich, you need to sort, sort that out. You're no, up there, aren't you? I'll, I'll, uh, I'll take my mobile phone down so it can get a hotspot. <laughs> 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 or if anybody's in, in uh, around uh, Asda in West Bridgeford in Nottingham, that's, that's yeah, where go. I think at the moment. Go and take your Wi-Fi down there and help Chris out. 
yeah, ask Chris to if you've got a good strong Wi Fi and go and pick him up, take back to your house. Um, <laughs> I, th- I, I think Chris was going to be talking about the uh match stats there, wasn't he? So, um, got I didn't actually it. see what the I haven't got the, the stats in front of me, but I always back, might be back with us. There he is. Can you hear me okay now? Yeah, that's better. <laughs> oh, is he, did just <laughs> fallen over? So, I just I, I spoke. <laughs> I spoke to Chris today about lives. <laughs> Over to you, Chris. <laughs> right, the match stats from today's game are as follows. If I haven't deleted them, I think I have. Oh, this is not good. This is not going well. You need a cameraman. You need a cameraman, Chris, seriously. <laughs> I do. I think I do. Right, so, of course, Rashalison put Spurs 1-0 up. At the end of the first half, Kulisewski made it two after 65 minutes. Basuma receiving a red card after 70 minutes. And surprisingly, Dian Kulisewski recording his first Premier League assist of the season. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Spurs are up to fifth. Well, we remain fifth in the Premier League. We've now played 17. We've, played, we've won 10, drawn three, lost four and got 33 points. Four points away from uh, top place Liverpool. Um Craig, let's come to you. Kulisewski, great ball to Hunmin Son. Son sh- uh, shooting at the goalkeeper just after three minutes. It was a good start, wasn't it? Do you think Son should have done better there? Yeah, yeah. I kind of expected him to, to tuck that away. We've been used to seeing that so often. To be honest, I think his touch took him just a little bit uh, too far inside and too far back. And it was kind of under his feet and it was a, more of a scuffed shot. Whereas normally he'd curl that into the far corner, but you expect Sonny to be finishing that, but um, it just wasn't his day today. But um, just just touching on Kulisevsky there, he's he's run the furthest of any Premier League player all season, which he, which is incredible. Um, his work rate is just unbelievable. Um, <laughs> you, you're actually up right now, Chris. <laughs> I thought you'd gone over again there. But yeah, I'm laughing at yeah. I'm laughing at a lot of these comments, I tell you. Yeah, I've had a nightmare. But Spurs have won, <laughs> so I don't care. Um <laughs> Lee, let's come to you. I don't want to be negative on this stream, but in that first half, the amount of times we give away the ball and it just seemed like we weren't playing under Ange Postacoglu in that first forty five minutes. The amount of time. Romero, Basuma, I could name Too others, slow. but but those two, it just seemed that they give the ball away multiple times. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I, it was quite it was quite frustrating actually because we have, we have been starting off really really well and keeping the ball and some of the passing certainly against Newcastle. I said on on a video that I made that, that I sat there and I literally went, "Wow, that, that's just unbelievable." And today that wasn't happening, and there was a lot of stray balls going about as well. You know, Saar was another one who who kind of the. the it felt like they were passing blindly, especially around the back. It kind of felt a little bit like really, inc- uh, you know, not not good uh, between them. They, they, there was no fluidity in there at all. And I'm not sure why that was. I, I don't know whether it was because, as I said, that Forest were a little bit more, um, you know, in our faces and kind of, of pushing us back. And I wonder whether that kind of rattled them a little bit, um, and they couldn't get the couldn't get the momentum that they wanted. So. I don't think it's negative. I don't think it's negative to point it out because because it was a little bit sloppy, um, and it's not something that we we really want to see. And we're not really used to it so early in a game. It's something that tends to creep in as 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 legs get a bit tired and concentration dips a little bit rather than rather than at the start of the game where we're kind of all over and really pushing to to get on top. Rich, let's come to you. Let's talk about the goal right at the end of the first half. What a ball in from Kulisewski and uh, Richarlison couldn't miss. And, you know, a lot of people are talking about Spurs signing a striker in the January transfer window. Um, suddenly, richarlison has got three and two. What does that mean? <laughs> Not a lot if he uh, if he stops scoring from now to the end of the season, for sure. Um, yeah, obviously, fantastic ball in for the goal. Um, he's got that quality, as we know. Um and works tirelessly for the team. Um and obviously Craig Craig alluded to earlier, obviously he's he's the uh player across the league that's obviously covered the most mileage uh through the ninety plus minutes of the games. 
uh, which is impressive. But it also it shows that he's working tirelessly for the team on and off the ball. Um, and that means that you're going to get those opportunities in front of the, the goal. And obviously, what we wanted with Harry was to be in front of the sticks more, to obviously just uh, tap in more of those those uh, those crosses. Um, but I think uh, Richarlison's, it's all confidence. Well, when you when you listen to people talk about um, striking, it's all about confidence. It's all about he's clearly technically gifted, um, obviously nationally, and obviously for his previous club Everton. And I think we haven't seen the best of Richarlison. Yes, there's still a lot of people out there that are very sceptical about his uh, position within the team and the squad, and whether it's shall we cash in on him or not. But clearly, he's, he's a kind of player that uh, teams don't like because he's uh, he works hard. Richarlison worked hard. You can tell today. I felt he was he was if if somebody would lose the ball, he'd, he'd kind of defend from the front. And I know Postecoglou really does value the work rate of Richarlison for the team, and sometimes that is enough. But obviously, as a striker, we want to have somebody that's not wasting those chances in front of the uh, sticks. Craig, let's come to you. As I mentioned um, in this evening's game, there was so much noise from the home end. Um, And also, when Brennan Johnson went off injured in the 28th minute, uh, the Nottingham Forest fans were singing, he's one of our own. Uh, He got a really, really good reception when he went off. Um, What did you make of uh, Brennan Johnson's um, performance up until that point? Um, it was okay. I thought I thought he was struggling at parts to get into the game, to be fair to him. Um, I'm sure he would have grown into it a bit more, but he didn't really. I'm sure he's as gutted as we all are that he had to come off against his old club. And his dad was in the um, in the away end as well. I'm not sure whether his dad's a Forest fan or a Tottenham fan or a Brendan Johnson, just a Brendan Johnson fan, but he had a Tottenham scarf on and a Tottenham uh, lapel badge. Um, so, yeah, he's shame so really. <laughs> Sorry, he used he to did, play for yes, Forest. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know he did, but I didn't know if you know a lot of players obviously play a long time for for clubs, but actually support other ones, don't they? Yeah, so yeah, for sure. um, I wasn't sure about that. I would imagine it's Forest, isn't it, Rich? Yeah, it's got to be. But um, yeah, shame he had to go off. Shame he had to go off. Interesting fact though about Richarlison, he scored as many Premier League goals as Gareth Bale. Can you believe that? So I know. Uh, Gareth Bale. It surprised me when I read that stat, but Gareth Bale wasn't really a striker, I suppose. So perhaps he's saying that Bale's better than Richarlison, probably. <laughs> I'll get excited when he scored as many as Gareth Bale in a Spurs shirt, though, Craig. <laughs> absolutely. Abs- absolutely. Yeah. 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 100%. Lee, let's come to you. Um, Skip came on for the injured Brennan Johnson. And by the way, it was a deep cut to the head, not concussion. Um, of course, then um, Kulisevsky went out to the right. Um, and then Skip went central. What did you make of uh, Skippy tonight? Uh, what do I make of Skippy? Um, is, 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 he, is, is he going to get a lot of game time under Ange Postacoglu? And do you think that he fits the Ange Postacoglu system and the way? And I suppose I could ask that same question to Pierre Mujoybier as well, because... Let's be honest about it, Lee. Pierre Mujoybier has had limited opportunities this season, but every single time Ange has uh, called upon him, he's done a great job. Yeah. So coming back to the first question about about Skippy, I personally don't think he's good enough in in the in the longer term scheme of things. I think he comes on and he does a bit of a job and, and all the rest of it. But I think he's well down the pecking order in my in my opinion. Um, he kind of tends more to slow the game down and and, and stuff like that. It gives away the ball a little bit as well for me, um, and it's it's almost got it's almost it, it almost reminds me more of Winks of how that kind of how he kind of really came on, really did really really well, and then all of a sudden he kind of drops down the pecking order, doesn't get as much game time, and, and then he kind of tends to lose his way, and I'm. I, I just don't see it. I just don't see it for him, if I'm honest. Hoiberg, I think, is quite is a little bit different because I think Hoiberg has a part to play. I think when you're when you're winning games 
and you need a little bit of steel to come in um, just to kind of settle things down. You needed a little bit of experience, someone who's got a bit of a, you know, a, a sensible head on. I think he comes in and he does the job that that um, Ange Postacoglu wants from him. Um, so, and, and he's come on pretty much every game, I think, as a sub. So he's still getting plenty. Of, he's still getting plenty of football, uh, although not maybe starting the games. Um, but I think there's a part, a, a place for him in the squad, not necessarily in the in the first eleven. But I think there's definitely a, a place for him. It's whether he wants that type of role or whether he wants to go and be a main player for a team, which is which is what most players want, right? So I, I would expect that probably at the end of the season he'll he'll, he'll move on. I, I'm, I'd like to think he'll probably get to the end of the season. I wouldn't really want to see him go in January, if I'm honest. I think he's good to have in the squad. But then it depends on on who we bring in. Um, so for me, I think, you know, Skippy, I, I, I don't see it. I, I really don't see it. I, I, I felt that we kind of were a bit worse when he came on, you know, from losing losing Brendan Johnson. Um, and I know that it's a change of the, the shape of the team and so on, but um, for me, he kind of lost his way. But Hoiberg, I think, has a part to play, uh, certainly in the squad. There was a good chance for Pedro Poro from a Hunmin Song cross in the 35th minute. Um, and then Spurs gave the ball away. Gibbs, White, shot over the bar. Udogi got the yellow card, as you've already mentioned. And then, of course, Richarlison put us 1-0 up um, just before the half-time break. Rich, going in at the half-time break, um, there are a number of Spurs fans not very happy with that 45 minutes. What do you think Ange Postacoglu would have said to the Spurs team at halftime? I think I just reinforced what they were doing in the previous games um, and and how they weren't they weren't really playing as a team. Um, very slow. I felt the amount of times the, the sideways balls that were slow and even because of the speed of moving that the ball, there was not a lot of movement. So the opportunities to break the lines was very limited because of how they were how they were actually moving the ball, and we we've so used to that kind of one touch one touch football, and it, we definitely came away from that in that first half. I think the manager would have gone into um, the, the half time break quite relieved that we were able to pinch that that goal, um, and actually thankful that we'd taken that opportunity um, and then to get the, the players back in the dressing room and then just to reinforce some of those messages, especially for the one of the one or two of the players that have maybe just lost the way a little bit. And I think um, the central midfield wasn't as, as, at its best today. And I actually feel that the likes of Hoiberg and Skip will get a lot of uh, playing time because of suspensions and injuries. I think you look at Saar for four yellows, um, obviously, with the suspension from today's game, I think you'll find that both of them will get playing time over the coming weeks. Craig, let's come to you. I want to go back to uh, talk about Richarlison because, of course, he's got three goals in his last two games now. Um, he's had his injury problems. Andrew's even come out and said that, you know, he's had injury problems and, you know, he's felt, he's felt it. He's really felt it. He's come back, had surgery. Do you think finally this is going to be the time when we see the best of Richarlison and he will be banging him in virtually every week? I hope so. Um, I, I don't know uh, if, I'm, if I'm brutally honest, but he does look like he's running freer. Um, that header today was a proper centre forwards finish. That, Sonny wouldn't have been able to do that. For all these brilliant attributes, Sonny's just not the best header of the ball. So I love having a, a proper number nine in the number nine position because that that was an outstanding header tonight he could have got easily got clattered by the goalkeeper he had defenders around him and he was brave and and he and he put the ball in the back of the net so uh, he's he's capable of it he, he's shown tonight he's capable of it and he richarlison's work rate is he's, he's he's brilliant i have to say closing down um relentless pressing uh, tackling from the front, and it's exactly what Ange needs and Ange wants. So, um, can he do it? Possibly. I think. I think he could. He could cert certainly. When you when you when you're a striker, you do thrive on confidence. That's been said, and you know he, he's got 
he's got three goals now in, in, in a week. And it, it's, um, you know, confidence breeds confidence. And, it, and he'll feel like a million dollars now he's got those goals. So, so I, I just really hope he can. But that doesn't mean to say I don't think we still need another centre forward or a forward thinking player in, in, in the transfer window. I think I still think we yeah. do. Because Richarlison's never been prolific. The most goals he scored in the Premiership season is 13. So, you know, that's not prolific, prolific enough to me. But if he's got somebody to push him and he keeps keeps injury free and he keeps going with this form, there's no absolutely no reason what why he can't. Lee, are you fully behind Richie? Um, I, I agree with Craig. To, to be honest with you, I, I think he's had some. He's, he's had a lot of issues, so we, I really want to see that out of the way. You know, he's had the, the mental health issues with family members or, or friends or whatever. Then he's had this injury. He's had his he's had his surgery, and you can't ask more from him than to score in three goals in the in the three game. Is it three games? I think he's been back, although it was only sort of five minutes for one of them. So he scored three goals in three games. You can't ask for more than that, really. You know, three goals in two starts. So that's what you want from your striker. So I'm, I've always been for the underdog. I always want to see the underdog really do well. I want to see them really, really get somewhere. So, you know, my heart's in it for him. Um, but I, I agree, again, I agree with Craig. I think we do need somebody else um, to, to back that up. I'm, I'm not sure about the young lad, whether, whether he, how much time he's going to get and what he's like in training, whether he's, whether he's going to be able to, to kind of fill some of that, some of that in and, and get some goals himself. So I think we probably need someone else just to, just to kind of keep Richie on his toes, I guess. Lee, let's stay with you because in the 58th minute, Nottingham Forest thought that they'd equalise, making it 1-1 with a Langer scoring. It went to VAR. It took a couple of minutes. Everyone in the stadium uh, didn't really know what was happening. And right at the end, um, VAR decision came up. Um, it was offside. And then when we saw the picture with about three or four players offside, why did it take so long? I have no idea what's going on there with VAR. I'm, I'm, I've said it many times. I'm not a fan of it. I'd much rather the referee and the linesman at the time make a mistake based on, you know, real time football than for someone to make a mistake after watching half a dozen replays of the same thing, drawing lines and all the rest of it. So I have no idea why it takes him so long to work that out. I think it's probably fear of getting it wrong is probably the answer, but. But it was a clear offside for me, and they had the, they put the picture up straight away, and I think everyone at home who was watching it could see he was he was offside. So it, it's a strange one for me. But I, I know what it is. It's the dodgy Wi-Fi. That's what it is, Chris. <laughs> yeah, probably. I'm, I, I'm still here. It's just that the lights have gone off. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's it. That's, as the close at eleven in Nottingham. Oh wow! What what a nightmare <laughs> I've had on this podcast. <laughs> You want to get to a nightclub, Chris? You want to get back to a nightclub, nightclub and dance, dance around your handbag? <laughs> I was just about to say, um, Pedro Poro had a shot blocked, Hunmin Son had a shot blocked, and then uh, Kulisevsky put the ball in the net for uh, to make it two. Rich, what did you make of the second goal? Yeah, obviously power. Uh, but I think you could see that coming. You could see how dangerous we were um, on the break. And when you've got the quality up front that we have, you're always going to be a threat. And obviously it was on uh, Kulisewski's weaker foot and he just put his foot through it. And I think if... I know the, the goalkeeper's going to get a bit of criticism because it was literally straight at him. But I think he hit it so <laughs> hard and any kind of movement from that ball would have just took it past him anyway. Um, I think when you look at, obviously, our front three or... or or definitely those kind of four forward-thinking players. We're going to get those opportunities, and uh, we, I, I was just—I was thankful tonight that we could actually at least have a little bit of breathing space because, after, obviously, after the red card, it was pinnacle really that we actually had two goals um, in the bank. Because I know I was sitting here going, "Yes, if boys score now, they would have all the momentum going into the last 10, 15 minutes." Was it going, Chris? You're right. Craig, let's come to you. What did you make of Basuma's red card? I know we've touched on it already, but of course he's now going to be out. It's going to probably look like he's going to be back in a Spurs shirt sometime in February because, of course, he's going to go off uh, to um, uh, international duty with Mali. 
yeah. Uh, just, just lunacy again. I just, like I said earlier, you could see it come in. Soon as that was that heavy touch, he, he was, you could see what he was going to do in that tackle. And for me, it was a red card. Um, interestingly, like Lee says, being a fan of VAR, I'm not sure if I am or I'm not. I think I, I, I think it definitely needs work. I and mean, personally, with things like offsides, I think it needs to be automated and let the referee know on his watch. Or, or in his ear, li- literally instantly. You can't tell with all the technology in the world, they can't do that. So I think that needs to be refined. But something like that, that, you know, it was a red card. Obviously given the yellow in the first instance, but looking at it, it was a bad tackle. So he's fully deserved. The thing is, he misses Everton, Brighton, Bournemouth, and he would miss Burnley as well in the FA Cup. Um, but what, as you what, say, he's prob- mm-hmm. probably going to be off by then anyway, so we won't see him till February. So what I don't understand yeah. is obviously the consistency, though. Obviously, if he's if he's sending sending him off, then why didn't uh, Murillo get a second yeah. yellow for that tackle? Uh, and he just warned the player. I don't get what how, how why why would you warn a player instead of actually saying, well, that was actually warrant of a, a yellow card, and he should have had a yellow card. And then that would have been 10 men each. Yeah, well, that's um, not VAR, though, is it? That's just the, the officiating on the pitch. It's, I get what you mean, though. It's just I mean, that, there, that, but but yeah, they, none, of it's, yeah. none of it's actually yeah. VAR, is it? Like, the reality is none of it's VAR. None of, it's not the system that's the problem. It's the inconsistency of the yeah. people looking at yeah, it and the sure. referees. Yeah, totally. And people, and people make totally. mistakes, right? So that's why I'm saying it. the referee on the, in the match is seeing things at full, full pelt, makes a decision... You can kind of go, oh, right, okay, he's, he's, he's seen what he's seen it. When someone's sitting in a room with dodgy Wi-Fi next to Asda's in Nottingham <laughs> and, they, and they can't get it right, <laughs> like watching it 10 times, you think to yourself, well, how can you make a mistake? Because we can yeah. see it. And I'm sat at home here in Paul yeah. next to me piano there. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and, I can, and I can I can see I, I, I can see it's a mile offside or it's a red card or whatever. So... It's the inconsistency of the people applying yeah. the, the the rules or making a decision yeah. around it, and the, the problem is all people will see things differently. So if everyone mm. sees it differently, you're always going to have their mistakes, and that's the problem with yeah. it. You, you're never going to you're never going to take that out unless you have the same person watching every single game. Yeah, but even I, then, even I, then, mm. yeah, yeah, even then, people get. Can I just come back just while I think of it? Can somebody tell me what Vicario was doing in the first half when when it was actually handball and the guy, what was he doing when he punched he, it? He out? did that. I don't. He did that a few times. He didn't punch it. He pushed it. He flattened. He flattened yeah. it basically. Yeah. yeah. He did that. But he did that a couple of times in the match today. Bizarre. Which I was like, yeah. is, why is he doing that? Yeah. Crazy. Anyway, I'm, I'm looking forward to you playing the piano actually, Lee, right at the end of the show. So uh, tell us what you're going to play. Um, Rich, let's come to you. Um, in the 71st minute, of course, after that sending off, Richarlison went off, Hoybier come on. Uh, and in the 79th minute, Hunmin Son received the yellow card. He took one for the team because Nottingham Forest were on the counter attack. I'll tell yeah. you what, this is what I have noticed differently about Hunmin Son because Sonny wouldn't have done things like that, you know, in recent seasons. And I think that And has, has really instilled this um, aggress- a- aggressive side to a lot of the players, including the leader, Hunmin Son. For sure, for sure, and obviously, if you're the club captain, then you're leading from the front clearly. Um, and that was a, a crucial time in the game um, that um, that could have obviously changed the outcome of the game, the, the result. And um, I think Sonny was at that stage like playing on fumes as well. Really, he um, he was clearly knackered, and when he when he came off, you could you could tell he'd given everything. And I think yeah. that's the difference, isn't it? You know, when you see Sonny at the end of the game, like the the West Ham game, he was like sitting on the on the bench, like crying because he'd given everything, knowing that we shouldn't have been on the losing side. Uh, and that, yes, that is definitely um, the difference. Yes, there's still some frustration around. Sometimes he should pass, but I think generally he's doing stuff for more for the team and. For, for the team moving forward. So really building confidence in players such as uh, Richarlison. We wouldn't have got that second goal, sorry, because we wouldn't have got that second goal if it wasn't for Sonny, right? Yeah. Because he, he closed the keeper That's down, forced the, forced the mistake. And when he was running at him from nowhere, 
to yeah. force that error uh, uh, to, to play the ball to Kulazewski to, to to get that goal. So without him doing that, we wouldn't have had that second goal. Can, can, I, can I ask you then, Lee, um, what do you make of the criticism from, from some Spurs fans to say that he lacks some leadership skills? Because I, I don't see that. I think that he's been a fantastic leader this season. I think that he is a completely different player this season. Even little things like that, taking the yellow card, which I've ne I've, ne I've not seen him do in, in recent seasons. No, absolutely not. I, I, I'm not sure who would be able to criticise him in terms of his leadership. I, I mean, when, when they first appointed him as the captain, I was like, what, really? Son? Um, Why? Why? Well, I, I, just because I didn't consider him as that sort of outgoing leader type person. But since he's got that role, you can see the difference in there. You can see him leading. You, and you can see the other players listening to what he's saying and taking on board what he's saying. You, you can see him geeing them up. You can see him talk, talking to the players and telling them what he wants and leading from the front and doing the things, like you said, taking a yellow card, chasing down the goalkeeper uh, and putting in that putting in that effort. And I, and I think you've seen that change of him. So like for me, the, at the beginning of the season, I, I didn't think it. I thought... It seemed an odd, an odd one, but actually, he's shown me that that I was totally wrong. Now I think he's, I think he's a very good captain. I think he does all the right things. Rich, let's come to you. In the eighty-first minute, um, Turner made a good save from Kulusevski's shot. It looked like he was going to go right in the bottom corner. Um, in the eighty-fourth minute, a good uh, break from Nottingham Forest, but they shot wide. A good save from Vicario on the line in the eighty-fourth minute. Um, what have you made of Vicario this season? Well, well, I think obviously the, his critics initially um, became plaudits after a couple of games, and I think he's he's obviously a very young keeper that's obviously very highly thought of. Um, gives us a lot more variety from the ball from the back, and I know from having Lloris uh, in in between the sticks with no ability at his feet at all, to having a keeper now that can actually come out, close down, uh, play with his feet, very consistent with that, obviously. He's good in the air as well, good shot stopper, very instinctive with his uh, with his saves as well, like that save on the line today was incredible. That was looking like a, a certain goal from Toffolo. Um, yeah, really impressed. Obviously, definitely the right decision to go with him. Um, and... He, I'm sure he's a player that, um, with more games and more performances like that, he's going to uh, gain more confidence moving forwards. Another clean sheet as well. Do you know what I really noticed tonight? Um, when there was a break in play, uh, Vicario went over to Ben Davis and um, Christian Romero a number of times. Um, he was even arguing with Christian Romero at one point in the game because he wasn't happy with what the other one was doing. Um, I love seeing that. And I'll tell you what, yeah. I've probably seen Vicario communicate with the defenders more times than I've ever seen Hugo Lloris in all the years that we've watched Hugo Lloris play for Spurs because he seemed to be a very quiet character on the pitch. But Vicario is very loud. He wants to constantly communicate with the defence, which is great to see. Um, I have now got the uh, match stats. Um, Nottingham Forest had 33% of the ball to Tottenham, 67%. Nottingham Forest had 15 shots to Tottenham's 12. Forest only had one shot on target to Tottenham's six. Corners, Forest six, Spurs four, and fouls, Forest 16 to Tottenham's 11. Um, Craig, let's come to you because uh, Hun Min Son went off. Emerson Royale came on in the 88th minute. Forest had another chance, went wide. The ball then went up. We had eight minutes to play. Um, I hate the term Spurs, you know that. But at that point, were you ever nervous to think that Forrest might come into this game and Spurs would throw it away? I've got to ask that question because I think there are a number of Spurs fans inside the stadium thinking that. I, th I, th I think, if we're honest, I think everybody will be thinking that because we're so kind of used to it. Um, but is Anne going to change it. this attitude? You would, yeah, I mean, what I would say on that, Forrest were very poor in front of goal. This yeah. evening, they they did have better chances. So so in reality, I wasn't as worried as I would have been had that been against perhaps a Manchester City or or, or a Liverpool or something like that. But um, I mean, you would hope Ange is, is installing that in us a little bit, little bit of more steel. I mean, he did obviously make that defensive substitution towards the end, which I was quite pleased about. 
Um, but yeah, so eight minutes to go. It, it did seem like an eternity when that ball come up. You think generally, you think you get to ninety, and you think, oh, okay, well, it's nearly there. And then another eight minutes. It was just um, seemed to drag on. But I thought we managed that eight minutes pretty well. All right, they did hit the post. The ball bounced off Vicario. I mean, another day that hits him and goes in. Yeah. The save he made was simply outstanding on that. And it was a save. It, it, his legs were in there and he kicked it away. It was, didn't just hit him. Um, he made some cracking saves. So, um, we, look, we fully deserved that victory tonight. But, you know, and, and just, it, and we're still going to go through tough times over the next few weeks because of the suspensions and the injuries. It, uh, I'd love to see Ange with a full strength squad for a couple of weeks, you know, where he's playing his. Like, like we had at the beginning of the season, but we have a couple of additions off the off, off the bench in the transfer window that can change the game. I mean, if you look at it, Dogi misses um, the Everton game now, so we're gonna we're gonna be having probably Porro, Romero, Davies, and, and I'm guessing Emerson Royale at left back, um, and then obviously in the middle you're gonna have Hoybier, perhaps and Saar, and then Kulishevsky in the ten role. So. You know, and it obviously depends on Brendan Johnson. I think they said on the telly it went down as a concussion substitution. Whether he was concussed or not is another thing, but I don't know the rules about that. I know Romero had that against Brentford and it was touching over whether he'd make the man new game and he did in the end. But um, I don't know how many days it is or if he is and needs a certain amount of days or whether the club doctor just assesses him and see how he gets on. But luckily, we've got a few players that can fill in up front anyway. We've got Villiers. Um, as well, so I'm sure we'd be okay. But, uh, but yeah, yeah, tough, tough few weeks coming up, I think. Yeah, and Postecoglou in his press conference has just confirmed that Brennan Johnson will be okay. He said he should be okay. He got a nasty yeah. cut on his head. Nothing that should keep him out. No concussion, just a cut on his head. Um, there was a good move, Lee, in the um, in stoppage time. Kulisevsky, Hoybier, and. Uh, Pedro Poro, who shot over the bar, it was a, it was a good move though. Yeah, I, I thought you know, you know, again, just going back to this Spursy thing because I hate hate that as well. But he's, he's, that, he's in the dark there again. Um, I hate that term as well. But I, I did in my pre-match um, chat, I, I did say you know this, this, we're hoping that Doctor Tottenham doesn't come back and and all the rest of it. So I I, um, I, I saw the eight minutes go up and I thought, oh, here we go. You know, and I was sweating it a little bit. As I said, right at the very start, I was a bit, you know, my blood pressure had to kind of go up. Um, but, yeah, I um, towards the end, we kept we, we actually created some chances, which was which was really good to see, to be honest with you, because uh, in previous times, we'd have tried to, to just sit deep and, and hold on and hold on and hold on and, and try and just get away with it. And inevitably, we would have given one away because, you know, let's be honest, in seasons gone past, we'd have lost this game. You know, yeah. we, we, we'd have lost this game, and that's why they come up with this Spursy thing because we'd have we'd have thrown it away, uh, especially when you consider what happened against West Ham not so long ago. So, it, I, I was kind of glad we made those poor passing errors in the beginning of the game, uh, in the end, rather than rather than like we normally do right at the end. So, um, but yeah, it was good to see that we we still kept on going. We didn't just try and sit back and 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 see it out just for the sake of it. And, it. and it's a shame, really, we didn't get that third goal and really, really crush it. So who are we going to go with uh, for your man of the match? Rich, who are you going with? Davis. Craig? I'm, I'm going to say Davis. If they could have got a goal and the assist, I just thought Ben Davis was outstanding. Lee? Yeah, I, I, I agree with these guys. I, 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 um, I was surprised... No, I wasn't surprised really because he, he got a, he got a goal, he got an assist, so that, that's always going to take points. But for me, I, I thought Davis was really good, and he gets criticised so much. So for him to have such a good yeah. game, I think it's fair that, that he's called out that he had such a good game because, yeah. as I say, people people slag him off constantly, and I don't think he's as bad as people people play him out to be. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go with uh, Dian Kulusevski, but I think that Ben Davis had a a fantastic game and long may this continue because I think he's been a great servant to the football club and as I said earlier, every single time he's come in under Ange, he's done a great job. Um, Rich, let's come to you. Um, we're going to talk about the transfer window and what you think we need uh, but first of all, I've got a short clip from uh, former Tottenham Hotspur player and manager Tim Sherwood on what he thinks Spurs need this January. 
How you doing, Tottenham fans? And it's Postacoglu. Wow, what can I say? What a job that man's done. He's lifted the cloud away from Tottenham from the last few years, playing an attractive style of football everyone wants to watch. Not only Tottenham fans, but everyone. If they strengthen in January, I think they're going to need centre-back uh, and maybe a creative midfield player, just in case Madison picks up any more injuries. Um, and I think they can go all the way to the top four this year, possibly the FA Cup, fingers crossed. Come on, you Spurs. Rich, creative midfield player and a centre-back. I think everyone's saying that Spurs need a centre-back. Is that what you'd go for? Yes, I think Tim Sherwood's been out on the sauce, hasn't he? <laughs> is he a Spurs fan? Is he a Spurs fan, Tim Sherwood? No, I don't think so. It's not, it's obviously, because yeah. he's managed Spurs, hasn't he? Yeah. Uh, um, what, do, what do I think Spurs need? I, th I think, um, yes, we definitely need centre-back. Um, and um, for me, I think a striker would be with somebody that we'd look towards. But whether we'd get that one of those in January uh, of the calibre that we actually need, I, I'm, yeah, I don't think so. Um, but maybe some more recruits in that midfield area as well. So maybe three players, but I would settle for two and that would be a centre-back and uh, somebody up front. Is that as an absolute minimum, Rich, you think that Spurs need two players to really help Ange this January? Yeah, I, I would say minimum, yeah. Because obviously you look at, the, look at how um, we are at the moment and then we've obviously got to go through um, losing some of the uh, the players to the African nations, um, etc., as well as suspensions, as well as injuries, that then becomes apparent that we're going to be right down to the bare bones, and and some of our academy players are going to get some real minutes, and that isn't a bad thing, but um, I think for for Tottenham moving forwards, we need to have the competition within the side, and we need to have a strong first eleven. Uh, we're definitely not going to get three defenders and two midfielders and a striker for sure. Uh, <laughs> I think, I think, I think um, we might get one of those kind of Van der Vaart signings. Hey, eh? somebody might just kind of, and you might have his eye on somebody, and then somebody might come in and kind of really kind of propel the team to the top three. Um, well, I think we, we, we got Lucas Moura in the January window. We got Dian Kulusevski and Benson Kerr in the January transfer window. So. Yep. The club has proven in recent years that we sure. can go out and sign decent players in January. Yeah, yeah for sure. And Porro. Yeah, and, and I'm yeah. sure they are. Yeah, exactly. And, and I know the teams are now kind of kicking themselves because they didn't actually take the punt on them. Um, I, I think, have you obviously you look at the, the climate at the moment, and I think uh, I think for me, the, 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 they already know the kind of players they want. Uh, and clearly, it is a centre-back. And uh, clearly, it is somebody in that that, that striking position. Where it took us so long to get Madison, hasn't it? Just think about how long we wanted a player like Madison. That was like ever yeah. since Ericsson moved on. And uh, I think for me, if, if, if within a within a year or less than a year, we're going to get another player in that position straight away, I, I'm not sure that's realistic. What about you, Craig? What do you think Spurs will do in the January transfer window? What do we need to do to really back and to try and finish in those Champions League spots at the end of the season? Yeah, as I've said before, I think we just need to give him the players that he wants. I know, I know that's easier said than done, but I'm presuming he's not going to be asking for the world because he, he never seems to be that sort of manager that he's going to be asking for big name players. Oh, you would hope that the players he asked for are all quite achievable, but I'm, I'm with Rich 100%. I think they need a centre back and I'd li like somebody in a striking position. Um, being greedy, I think a third for the midfield, a, a six or an eight perhaps, uh, or somebody that can combine the two, the two for the players we're losing. Perhaps Bissouma wanted Christmas off. Perhaps that's what that was all about. Perhaps he wants to watch the darts. I don't know. Harry Kane was at the darts tonight, apparently. Um, but, yeah, apparently. Um, but, um, but Craig, yeah, can, I just, I, can I just push yeah. you on that Basuma subject? Because many people have spoken mm. about Romero needs to calm down. What does Ange need to say to Basuma? <laughs> Same as what he said to Romero, probably. We need you on the pitch. You're no, absolutely no good um, not being available for the team. Um, he's, he's just got... A, I mean, the one against... Luton, the sending off against Luton was, was just ridiculous. The one tonight was utterly ridiculous. It was just avoidable. 
absolutely avoidable. He wants to go and play the piano. That's what I tell him to do. He'd turn him and get around Lee's house and play the piano. Yeah. That probably calms you down a bit, you know. Uh, <laughs> can, I, can, I, can, I, to... can I just say to the people listening to this on an audio platform, if you are still with us, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> that, that Lee has got a picture, or, or is it a real piano in the background, Lee? We don't know. Um, he's got a piano in the background and we're all looking forward to hearing Lee play the piano because I'm sure he is absolutely magnificent. This is a grand piano as well. It's yeah, a this, piano. Is my country, this is my country mansion. <laughs> um, Lee, let's come to you on the transfer window. What does Spurs need to do as an absolute minimum for Ange? Uh, as, a, as an absolute, absolute minimum, they've got to get some some backup for that central defence, as the, as the guys have already said. Um, I as, a, as I've already said with, with Davis, I think Davis has done really, really well and, and come in, but you've got to have another backup in case something happens to Romero or he gets another another red card or something of that nature, right? So so you've got to have someone who can who can play with play with Davis or play with Romero or play with Van der Ven. So, so that's an absolute bare minimum. Um I also I'm also a little bit worried about the about the left back situation in, in terms of, you know. We're going with Udogi week in, week out because he's fantastic. But but now he's not available. We're playing a right back in a left back position, and that worries me uh, slightly. So I would like to see someone in there because I'm not convinced about Sessegnon, and obviously Perisic is is long gone uh, at the moment. So that's another position that I think we should be should be trying to strengthen. Um, with regards to the Madison situation, we have got Lacelso. Um, and we have got Benton Core, who who can, and we've obviously seen kuniszewski has been able to kind of do quite well in those that position. So that there is opportunities around that. So I think they'll be probably be less likely to to focus on that, um, depending on what's happening with with uh, Geo. Um, and and as Craig said, I think it would be great to have a have a, a striking option. But I think the one they'll be looking at will be the centre back situation as the priority. Um, and again. As Craig has already said, I think with um, with this manager, he will look for the, the the type of person that plays in that position rather than a specific name who's a big name or that sort of stuff. I think you know, pulling out some of those kind of gems that from from different leagues, and that may be the way we end up going. And that may mean that we do get the get more options than just a one off one player uh, in in each window. Do any one of you think that any players will leave Spurs in the January transfer window? Because when you take in, into consideration all of the injury problems and now suspensions that we've got, I think it'd be quite surprising if anyone would leave, wouldn't it, Rich? Yeah, unless unless um, Dyer goes, maybe. Because um, he's not getting, obviously, he's getting overlooked, clearly. Um, and um, maybe the manager doesn't think he's part of those your first team plans moving forward so that might that might happen um but i i would think that the manager would want to keep the nucleus of all the players in the first team and the backup players um because the uh tendency would be to send some of the younger players maybe out on loan but i, I, I don't even think you can do that at the moment yeah there have been many reports uh craig about valise possibly going out on loan do you think that would be a good thing and Pierre Mihoybier is apparently trying to push for a move. The Celso is wanted by Barcelona. Um, do you see anyone leaving? Only if people are coming in, I think. Uh, the only person I'd see leaving is apparently I read tonight that Eric Dyer could be going in January. But I can't see how you let Hoybier and the Celso go, or even one of them, um, when we've got players leaving for the Africa Cup of Nations. Um, and obviously Sonny's... Um, Going to be going to be out probably till February because I can see South Korea doing pretty well in that tournament. He's in, so um, I it would be lunacy to do it to be honest. Because although these are fringe players, if you like, we we're going to need those fringe players because we keep getting bloody suspensions and injuries. So you know we can, we can't be calling kids up from the academy all the time. Um, we, we we've got a squad of twenty five. You you got to use them. Lee, on that subject uh, that Craig just mentioned about the academy players, do you want to see more academy players being used by Ange in the second half of the season? You know, I'd, I'd absolutely love that if they're good enough. 
you know, yeah, we, talk yeah. about, we talk about academy players and oh, no, they're only young and all the rest of it. Udogi's 20 years old. Yeah. Sars, what, 21 or something? You know, Vili's we've brought in. They didn't bring him in to be an academy player. Ange said this, he brought him in to be a to be a player in the in the in the team. And he's only a young player. So if these kids that we're bringing in from other countries are, are good enough from other academies, why are ours not good enough to play in that first team? So I'd I'd love to see our players come through from the academy, but they've obviously got to be good enough. So if they're as good as Udogi, Udogi, whatever you say, or, or Vélez or, or Saar or all these guys, then for me, yeah, bring them on. Bring them on. I'd, I'd love to see that. Rich, let's come to you. Um, of course, next up, Everton at home at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium on the 23rd of December. Um, how do you see this game going? Of course, Andrew's has got to make change or some changes uh, within the starting eleven. Um, how do you see the game going? Because Everton have come into form recently. Yeah, tough. It's gonna to be a tough game, um, and it's we need to get back to to playing how we were against Newcastle for sure. And I think for me as well, it's maybe a bit of a wake up call around um, the game today, um, and possibly Everton might do the same as Forest and might have that low block, um, <laughs> and uh, and it might be yeah another tough game, but. Um, Obviously, we're the we're going to be the twelfth man, obviously for that game. So hopefully, we can uh, drive drive the team forwards and and have another win. I think we've got momentum as well. Momentum in sport is is really key for success. Yeah. Um, and with momentum, you build confidence, and um, and then all of those kind of all of those routines, all those training things that you're putting into place day in and day out, all of a sudden come together. Hence the reason why, like Richarlison's not just scored once and then and then not scored again. He scored a couple and now he scored another one today. So those kind of positive behaviours are really starting to get ingrained, which is really positive. And um, that's what that's why I, I'd be really positive about another result against Everton. But it's definitely going to be a more difficult game than it would have been four or five weeks ago. Yeah, I completely agree with you, Rich. It is going to be a difficult game. Of course, there's no easy games in the Premier League, but I have a lot of confidence in this Tottenham team. No matter which players and picks, I think that everyone's given their absolute all at the moment and I, I expect another win and hopefully it'll be that party atmosphere at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium again two days before Christmas. Um, Lee, what is it about you when you come on this podcast, the amount of people who say you look like other people? People are now saying you look like Ange Postacoglu. <laughs> I don't know what they're talking about, mate. <laughs> I don't know. I've got one of them faces. You either want to punch it or, or make out it's someone else. I don't know. <laughs> Lee, what are you expecting from the Everton game next week? Uh, I think, as Richard said, I think it's going to be a really tough game, if I'm honest. I no game's easy in the Premier League. We know that. But Everton are just going into this real uh, purple patch. Um, I think the the ten point deduction has really has really helped them kind of push on because I think without that they'd have been right up there, which is a, which is a bit of a shame for them. Um, oh dear! <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Billy Mitchell. <laughs> actually, I can see that Billy Mitchell. That's that's actually not a bad shout, Billy Mitchell. <laughs> At least would have been worth Peggy Mitchell, wouldn't it? That would have been Do you know, nice. I, I, I don't give all the viewers enough credit for some of these messages sometimes. That's so it. thank you for putting a big <laughs> smile on my face. Um, yeah. Craig, People still watch TV as well, by the way. I'm like, I thought it was all YouTube now and stuff. It's like, we must have that older audience tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Craig, Everton game next week. How are you feeling ahead of it? Uh, I... I... I'm quietly confident, actually, even with all, all the things going on. Uh, Pep, I'll take that. Um, uh, to be honest, um, we haven't got a bad record against Everton, especially at home. So so I, I'm I, I'm quietly confident that we're going to get a result there, to be honest. It would be lovely to finish before Christmas in the top four, wouldn't it? Um, not sure that's going to happen, but um, you just never know. Um, City are beatable. Uh, we've proved they're a bit look a bit more fallible this season. Um, Liverpool obviously doing well. Arsenal, uh, yeah, <laughs> doing all right, aren't they? But um, everyone else, you know, we've opened up a little bit of a gap now behind us. Um, nobody can certainly overtake us. So, so you know, 
it's, why not? This, like Anne said, let the fans fans dream. And um, so yeah, I, I, I'm quietly confident with that Ever, Everton game, to be honest. Can I ask you all very quickly about the FA Cup? Because, of course, we faced Burnley at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium early January. Lee, let's start with you. Um, I know off air and, uh, you know, over the years, me and you have spoken a lot about cup competitions, FA Cup. It means a lot to me. It means a lot to you. Um, will Ange go all out to try and win this trophy? Do you think that uh, we will finally have a manager that um, just goes really, really strong in every round of this competition? Can you see that happening? I can, actually. I can see him going for this one because I think I think he will know how much it means to the fans. And I think, he, like he said before, he doesn't want to win a cup just for the sake of winning a cup. Um, but I think that's a bit of a naive comment, really, right back then. And I think that was on the back of come, get, losing in the League Cup. But for me, I, I really I really want to say... Why do they keep doing it when I'm talking? Um, I really want to <laughs> see, I really want to see us... I really want to see us take the FA Cup seriously. It's, it's the... It's the best feeling in the world for, for fans that have not seen Tottenham win the FA Cup. I can tell you, it is one of the best feelings in the world. I loved it, absolutely loved it. And being able to to see and parade it down the high road again, it's one of the highlights of, of, of my youth. I, I absolutely loved that situation. And, and I want my son and my grandsons to to uh, to get that feeling, to, to be able to, to see something like that happen. And, uh, and for a lot of people that go, oh, I'd rather be in the top four than win a trophy, that, that's because you've never seen us win a trophy. Like, you know, it is totally different. So mm. for me, he's got to go for it this year and, and give us a go. And if we don't get there, we don't get there. But you've got to try and you've got to try and have a go this time. I feel like there are a lot more people wanting top four than FA Cups before, Lee. But I think that's slowly changed. I think that's slowly moved. I think more people want a trophy now. Would you agree? I'd like to think so. I think we, we get it's all media driven, isn't it? It's all media driven about what's important and get the money in because that brings you the top players and blah, blah, blah. But actually, if you look at this team that we've got now, it's not made up of superstars. You, you've only got to look across the road at Chelsea where they've spent all this money to get the top players in inverted yeah. commas and it's not working for them. And that, and that happened when they first got all their money under Abramovich. Um, and it happened to, to City in, initially when they brought lots of styles in. Now they're buying the right sort of players and building their things. And I think you don't need you don't need to have that. You need to build the right sort of team with with a good mix of players. And I think playing good football like this is as is as attractive to bring players in as it is to to uh, and the opportunity to win an icon. And the FA Cup is iconic. It's it's. Players from all around the world will talk about the FA Cup. It's the oldest cup competition in the world. So if that doesn't uh, um, excite players, then I don't know what does. Rich, will we go seriously in the FA Cup all out? We have got to. And and, and, and also, um, as as professionals within within that sport, you want to be uh, inspired and motivated and and have those opportunities for success. And then they breed success as well. How many times do you have it where you'll have a, a team that will win the league or win, win a cup and then they'll go on to win two or three or they'll be in multiple finals? And that's because of that winning mentality. And I think what happens with the Champions League slots is that, is that clubs or fans will look towards European football without actually winning any, anything. So they'll go, oh yeah, we're in the Champions League uh, uh, spots, which means we play in Champions League. But Again, you're not winning anything within that process. You, you're, you're gaining a spot for another competition, but it doesn't give you that, like Lee was saying, that that day out at Wembley where you can obviously celebrate with your team and celebrate after with your friends as well. And I think that that those kind of moments are things that obviously like City have ha had in abundance. And you can see how it's that winning mentality. How do you go again and how do you build off those Every time you win, and it is tough. I know what that's like as an athlete trying to kind of go again after you've won something. It's it is really tough. But if you've if you've not got that mentality to win, and you just you you you, you kind of you, you settle for second best, that is a real challenge to um, get rid of that mindset because um, you have to. And I think this is what has happened when Postecoglou's come in. You have to get get rid of those those personalities that are in the changing room that are winners 
And I think that that's going to be a real change for for Spurs when when he gets his winners in the changing room, yeah. Um, with the with the right uh, mix of uh, experience and youth and energy, I think that's when he'll have the tools the tools for success. Craig Paul is asking here: um, any more guest appearances coming up for you? Um, of course, you um, you me and James appeared on the tapping the first ever. Uh, podcast for the Sun newspaper this week. Um, do you want to talk us through your performance of pumping up those footballs? Not really, no. But well, actually, it was forty. It was forty equipment for anybody that's watched it. Um, it's forty equipment. The the pump broke before we filmed it. Well, we was filming it and we had to do it again because 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 the needle, um, what well, it wasn't pumping the ball up basically. And if you watch the third ball, I'm doing it for ages. I'm pumping away and there's nothing going in the ball. And, and we got penalised for it, you know. And it needed to get bring on VAR, you know. It was terrible. It was shoddy equipment. So I, I, Bear Workman blames his tools absolutely, but it was the tools in this case. But yeah, had a thoroughly good, thoroughly good time on on the um, on the podcast there with the Sun. So that that, that was really good fun, I have to say. Uh, the only thing I'd ask for next time is the sofa be a bit higher because it was almost on the floor, wasn't it? I don't know if you know, I've got a long legs and I was kind of having to sit all awkwardly. But apart from that, it was group, it was great. Craig is the biggest diva I've ever known. That's all I say. <laughs> <laughs> full, full of excuses, full of excuses. Well, we know that Craig excuses. likes to have a moan. So this is a new segment in this podcast. Uh, right at the end of the podcast, this is Craig's moan of the week. <laughs> He's always moaning. So Craig, what are you moaning about this week? Yeah, I love the Cole Pilkington sort of aura. So but I've got a couple of moans. And one of them is about Mikel Arteta. How the hell has he got away with that? You know, you know this inquiry into the, his comments after the game. I have no idea. Someone wants to put in the comments what they think about Arteta and the way he spoke. I'm sure you've all seen it. How the hell has he not been punished? And my second moan is actually about Tottenham. Uh, well, I was trying to book tickets for that burn the FA Cup game that's stupidly on a Friday night. Um, but I was trying to book tickets 10 o'clock as soon as they went on sale for members. Got four brilliant tickets behind the goal, in the basket, went to pay, and it timed out within 30 seconds. Couldn't even approve it in the banking. Then went back on the website to book four more, and it wouldn't let me do it. I tried for about an hour. Every time it said, we're not letting you book them, we're not letting you book them. I don't know what happened, but eventually I managed to get four booked behind the goal in the north stand right next to the away fans so i got the tickets but Spurs you got the tickets so, the so what are you moaning about because i think i had brilliant seats chris i had the ones i wanted you know I had the ones we wanted in exactly the right position and it was a spurs bloody website that again let me down especially when you're trying to use it on a phone i tried it on a pc i tried it on my phone always the same oh it's unbelievable i know it's popular but christ put the put the technology in place so people can book seats because they were just disappearing all around me. It wasn't just me, honestly. It, it was the Spurs website. If anybody else had issues, you know what I'm talking about. Or perhaps it was just me. But yeah, Spurs, <laughs> sort it out. That's my moment of the week. <laughs> Lee, have you got anything to moan about this week? No, mate. My, my life is uh, is brilliant. <laughs> can tell by your house. <laughs> yes. to be fair to be fair this pi i was going to play you a tune but this piano does need desperately needs tuning so i'm not gonna i'm not gonna tinkle the ivories tonight because i it won't sound as good as i'd like it to perfectionist rich, you, got nothing, you got nothing to moan about this week rich have you no two wins, two wins. yeah two, yeah two wins um yeah no happy days that's it i think all fat uh, spurs fans including craig should have a have a, a pint and a smile this weekend. You can, watch, <laughs> you can watch match of the day on Saturday with a smile, knowing, knowing that business is already done. All right? Exactly. Yes, everyone should have a great weekend. Uh, Rich, lovely to see you earlier. Um, what are you up to at the moment? Where can people find you? And uh, I suppose you're training very, very hard again. Yeah, they can't find me anywhere. That's why I've got that big gate. I tell you, mate, that's it. <laughs> that big gate in front of my house. Stay away. No, so I'm, yeah, I'm training hard at the moment for marathons next year. Um, so deep in training. So that's why I'm always looking knackered. Um, but um, yeah, so Tokyo, Boston, London uh, before before June. So yeah, busy start of the year. 
but yeah, just uh, yeah, working hard and obviously trying to see every game that I can, and hopefully down at the stadium over that Christmas period as well, supporting the boys because it does really make a difference. Like everybody says, like the Spurs fans have been incredible this season. Yeah, and I've been the last couple of seasons where the atmosphere has not been great under Mourinho. Even under the Conte, it hasn't been great. But now, like like the boys know, it's been a nightclub. It's been like the the atmosphere has been incredible. And also the away fans at the away games, like Chris is every time is very complimentary about everybody that goes to games that really does uh, give the boys the support they need because uh, without the fans, it definitely wouldn't be the same. So well done everybody for going to the games and, 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 and singing the hearts out for sure. Well, Rich, lovely to have you back on and uh, have a great Christmas. And uh, Craig, thanks so much for coming on again. Um, pleasure to have you here. Where can people find you? What are you up to at the moment? When's your next TV appearance? <laughs> God knows. God knows. Uh, at Demon 9 on X, oh, if you want to follow me, that'd be great. Um, so, uh, somebody in the comments really made laugh. He said, even Big Angie get a tune out of that piano. <laughs> 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 well, that was very good. And somebody else that looked like Chiellini, that guy who's just retired from Juventus. I've been told that many times. So, so yeah, but at least he's retired now. I might not, he might just fade away into the background and people won't remind me how much I look like him. But, uh, yeah, always a pleasure to come on. Uh, I think I'm on again after Everton. So, uh, let's hope for another win. Lee, thanks so much for coming back on and uh, tell everyone about your wonderful channel, how it's growing and what they can expect from it. Yeah, cheers, uh, cheers, Chris. I know it's, it's been great to be on. I know it's been a while. We've been trying to organise to be able to get on again. Uh, work's keeping me keeping me really busy, so um, can't get as, as much as I want to. But um, I, I've really enjoyed it tonight. It's, it's been good. Uh, yeah, I, I've got my own channel uh, for anyone who sees it. Leader Dorset Spur. It's basically me moaning and and groaning about different bits and pieces, generally speaking. Um, I, I did have a little bit of a break for it because social media was getting me down, but. Um, I'm back now. Um, I'm putting out a video probably once or twice a week. So if you want to check it out, that'd be good. I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, I'm a little bit less than than Chris. Uh, you know, I haven't got a hundred thousand plus. I've I've, I've got one thousand. So you know, I'm, I'm a little bit behind him in the, in the stakes. But you know, I'm, I'm plodding on. I don't know I just, how. Can I can I just say sorry, Chris? Sorry, Tom said I look like Jason Statham. I thought I'll have that, and then somebody coming in. And I thought Jason Statham ain't got a nose that big. Oh, Jason Statham has a small <laughs> nose. Uh, uh, <laughs> brilliant! I love that. <laughs> I, I was going to say after my performance on this podcast, how the hell has this channel got over a hundred thousand subscribers? I have no idea. See, Lee, if I can do it, you can do it, mate. <laughs> I don't know how you've got 100,000 even that <laughs> shod, shoddy camera work to be honest with you I think, I think Craig holds it together most of the time to be fair so it should be, should be Craig's podcast <laughs> yeah but I, I, to, be, to be fair I'm, I'm, I'm sitting in a nice warm house on a laptop normally when I do it and Chris, Chris is going to all these locations trying to get a Wi-Fi signal so uh, <sighs> it's, uh, it's, it's hard isn't it sometimes yeah a genuine apology for the uh, really dodgy stream today uh, but let me just say before we go, um, I am actually heading home now um, or staying uh, overnight somewhere, uh, heading down to the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium tomorrow because the Spurs women face Arsenal women um, at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, 12 noon kickoff. So if you can get down there to support the Spurs women, um, it would be great to see you there and uh, support the team. And hopefully uh, the Spurs women can get back to winning ways in the WSL. So if you can make it, please do. Um, but Lee, Richard, Craig, thanks so much for joining me this evening. Uh, thanks to all of the viewers. Thanks to everybody who has listened in on the audio versions as well. Uh, we will be back with another edition of the Spurs Chat podcast where I will be indoors in the warm and all the cameras will work, I promise. Uh, until then, come on, Spurs. Come on, Spurs.